Let's take our Bibles at this time and open them together to the book of Acts, chapter 22, and verse 14. Acts 22, 14, for our message from the Word of God this morning. Acts 22, 14 will be on page 1180 if you're using the Pew Bible, the one we have there in the seats. Today's date is September 29th, 2019. Today's text will be in Acts 22, verses 14 and 15. And the title of this morning's message is What Difference does rightly dividing make to my witness? <clears throat> what difference does rightly dividing the word of truth make to my witness? And we begin this morning with a question. How many Jehovah's Witnesses does it take to screw in a light bulb? It takes three. One to screw in the bulb and two to knock on your door and ask you if you've seen the light. <laughs> Get it? Seen the light. <laughs> Note to self, don't tell that one in England. <laughs> How about this one? Did you know that Jehovah's Witnesses don't celebrate Halloween? It's true. I guess they don't like strangers coming to their door and annoying them. <laughs> Note to self, tell that one in English. Well, our subject this morning is witnessing and not the kind that Jehovah's Witnesses do. The kind that God's people do, or at least they should do, especially grace believers who rightly divide the word of truth. Because they know that Paul is our apostle. And they know that right after Paul got saved, the Lord Jesus Christ sent a man named Ananias to tell Paul that God had chosen him to be his witness to men. As we see, as we look at our text now in Acts 22, verses 14 and 15, where, speaking of Ananias, we read these words. <clears throat> and he said to Paul, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldst know his will, and see that just one, <clears throat> and shouldst hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. Now, the definition of the word witness is someone who has seen or heard something 
and then is willing to testify that what they saw or heard is true. As you see there in our text, when Paul was told that he'd been chosen to see the just one, to hear the words of his mouth, and then Ananias added, for thou shalt be his witness. Do you see how that defines the word witness? As someone who's seen or heard something. The Apostle Paul was an eyewitness who'd seen and heard the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was willing to testify to what he'd seen and heard. But now, that means, technically speaking, you and I can't be witnesses for the Lord, right? We haven't seen Him. And we haven't heard Him. So, how are we supposed to testify for Him? Well, the answer is, we have something that is even better than eyewitness testimony. And you're probably thinking, well, Pastor, what would that be? <laughs> well, what do you say we ask the Apostle Peter in... 2 Peter 1, 16 and 20, he said, speaking of himself and uh, James and John, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son. <clears throat> this voice we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. And then Peter said, we have also a more sure word, the scriptures. Did you catch that? Peter said that the scriptures were more sure than what he'd seen with his own two eyes and what he'd heard with his own two ears. And he's talking about when he was with the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration. And if you think about it, you know why he said that. How many of you remember many years ago, Brother Ken Fanning stood in front of the church here and did his magic act? his magic act that he did to explain the gospel to kids, you know, to keep their attention, little kids, while he was giving them the gospel. If you don't remember that, you've seen a magician on TV or in person, and you know you can't trust what you see with your own eyes, can you? And you know you can't always trust witnesses either. Because witnesses sometimes lie. Like the ones that they had testify against the Lord at His trial. But the Scriptures were written by God. The God that the Apostle Paul says in Titus 1-2 cannot lie. So the scriptures that God wrote are more sure than eyewitness testimony of men, don't you think? That means when Christians today, like ourselves, offer the testimony of the Word of God, what we have to offer is actually better than eyewitness testimony. It's better than if we could tell men what we've seen and heard. If we claim to have seen and heard the Lord. <laughs> so I would encourage you to use the Bible when you witness to people about the Lord. lady asked me on the internet at BBS the other day how to witness to her loved one who claimed... He didn't believe the Bible was God's Word. You know what I told her? 
use the Bible anyway. I reminded her that Paul calls the Bible in your next reference in Ephesians 6.17 the sword of the Spirit. Folks, that is a sword you're holding in your hand. The sword of God. And you've heard me say many times, no swordsman ever sheathed his sword just because the other guy said he didn't think it would cut. Right? There's a reason God didn't give us a backup weapon like policemen carry. <laughs> he didn't say, use my sword to witness. But if that doesn't work, well, here's plan B. <laughs> no! He said, use my sword and use it like this guy did in 2 Samuel 23 and verse 10, speaking of a man named Eliezer. He smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand claved to the sword. And the, and the Lord wrought a great victory that day. When Eliezer got tired of using the sword, he kept using it. And when he was done, they had to literally pry his fingers off of the sword. That's how tight his grip was to it. And that's how you should use the sword of the Spirit if you want the Lord to win a great victory in the hearts and souls of men. But that means that the first answer to our question, our title question of what difference does rightly dividing make to our witness is that rightly dividing makes our witness different than the witness of the apostles. Because we haven't seen and heard the Lord like they have. But that means that our witness is also different than some Christians today who say that they have seen and heard from the Lord. <laughs> and lest you think that they're not still out there, just this past week I got an email at BBS from a lady who said, and I quote, it's obvious that you are led solely by the written Word of God while I am led by the Holy Spirit. So, please take me off your mailing list. <laughs> and I wrote her back and I told her, Wow! That is high praise that you're giving us. Because of what David wrote in Psalm 138 and verse 2, when he prayed to God and said, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name." That lady couldn't have praised us any higher than to say you people are just following the Word of God and that alone. But that also shows there are still people who believe they see and hear from the Lord and they don't need a book to tell them what He said. Imagine that. Imagine having nothing more to offer men when you go to witness to them than the product of an over overactive imagination. <laughs> How sad is that when we have something more sure than what you can see with your own eyes. But now, rightly dividing the word also makes our witness different from God's people in the Old Testament. Because, and you're not going to believe this, but God's people in the Old Testament didn't do any witnessing. <laughs> At least as far as I see in the Scriptures. Uh, maybe you can think of some examples that I haven't. But now, that didn't mean that God didn't have a witness in the Old Testament. Look at your next reference in Acts 14 and verse 17. He left not himself without witness, Paul said, speaking of God, 
in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. That means in the Old Testament, God witnessed to himself by blessing men with rain and fruitful seasons. So he didn't need witnesses from his people. The fruitful world that he created witnessed for him and left them without excuse, Romans 1 says, right? And there was another reason why God didn't need his people to witness for him. And that is because of the way he witnessed for them. You say, well, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, look at your next reference carefully in Hebrews 11, verse 4, talking about one of the first believers in the Bible. <clears throat> Hebrews 11, 4, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. Did you follow that? Abel didn't testify of God. God testified of Abel. God didn't obtain a witness from Abel. <laughs> Abel obtained a witness from God. And do you know how he obtained a witness from God? It was the same way that God testified of the gift that you read about in Leviticus 9.24. There came out a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering. That's how God testified of Abel. And it's how he testified of David as well in your next reference. David in 1 Chronicles 21.26 built an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and called upon the Lord. And He answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. That's also how He testified of Solomon in Second Chronicles 7.1. When Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. Do you remember what Elijah did when he challenged the prophets of Baal to a showdown? Look what he said in your next reference. 1 Kings 18, 24-38. He told the prophets of Baal, Call on the name of your gods, and I'll call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And Elijah cut the bullock and laid him on the wood, and the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice that Elijah offered. Well, folks, as you can see, that's how God testified of the gifts of men. That's how He testified that the men who offered those gifts were accepted of Him. But if you think about it, that not only witnessed to them that they were righteous, it witnessed to everybody, unbelievers included, that the God they worshipped was the one and true God, didn't it? That's why God didn't need for His people to witness for Him back then. I mean, if you built an altar in your backyard, or let's make it your front yard, and, and offered an animal on it, and God answered it by fire in your front yard, would you have to tell your neighbor you worship the only true God? No! He would know it! Without a word out of your mouth. Now when God called the Jews to be His people through Abraham, he, he did some other things to prove that He was their God, right? He helped Joseph save the world from seven years of famine. 
Listen, that was a strong testimony that Joseph's God was God. Then he parted the Red Sea to let his people escape Egyptian bondage. We know that that was a, a really strong testimony for God because when Rahab the harlot heard about it, she left her harlot ways behind and became a believer in Israel's God. You know how you know that, don't you? It says that she hid the spies on the roof among the flax that she had on the roof. And listen, Proverbs 31 says, The virtuous woman uses flax to make cloth. Rahab had hung up her shingle as a harlot, and she had become a seamstress like the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. But now, here we have to ask ourselves a question. How come Rahab was the only one in all of Jericho who believed on Israel's God? Why didn't more people in Jericho flock to become believers in Israel's God if it was that powerful of a testimony? I mean, if you heard that the God of Israel had humiliated the Pharaoh of Egypt with those ten plagues and brought the greatest king on the planet to his knees, wouldn't you believe on a God like that? The reason more people in Jericho didn't is because they didn't want to leave their sins behind like Rahab did. <laughs> Do you remember what John said about the Lord in your next reference in John 3.19? This is the condemnation that, and it's speaking of the Lord Jesus, light is come into the world, <clears throat> and what? And men love light. Is that what it said? No! They love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. And listen, the same was true in Jericho. Because you see, the men of Jericho, they didn't just know that the God of the Jews was powerful. They knew the God of the Jews was holy. Look what Moses told the Jews in Deuteronomy 4.8. He says, What nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, the law of Moses that I have given you, which I set before you this day? The fame of God's holiness got around, folks, just like the fame of His power. So that, listen, the men of Jericho knew if they believed on the God of Israel, they'd have to leave their sins, <laughs> just like Rahab did. <laughs> and by the way, compare that to the gods of the Greeks who are always sleeping around and lying and envying and stealing and killing people. <laughs> you heard me say many times, the reason they invented gods like that is what? That's because if your God acts that way, it gives you an excuse to act that way. Those would be popular gods, don't you think? And if you liked living in sins like that back in the Old Testament, can you see why they wouldn't want to believe on the God of Israel? Sure. Did you know people still feel that way today? <laughs> Years ago, I was visiting my wife's family down in Alabama, <clears throat> and I was talking to a man about the Lord, and he said the reason he didn't want to get saved is because he didn't think he could live it. He didn't think he could give up the sins he loved. I think the truth is he didn't want to give up the sins that he loved. But can you see how God didn't need for His people to witness for Him? The way He witnessed for them was all the witness that He needed. 
And we see how well God's witness worked in your next reference when God healed a man named Naaman of, Naaman of his leprosy. Remember what Naaman said in 2 Kings 5.15? Behold, now I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Listen, leprosy was an incurable disease, wasn't it? So if your God could cure it, you didn't need people out there witnessing for you. Look what Nebuchadnezzar said after God delivered the three Hebrews in Daniel 3.29. God delivered them from the burning fiery furnace. And when he saw that, he says, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego should be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill. Their, their house will make it an outhouse. Because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then after God delivered Daniel from the lion's den. Look what King Darius said in Daniel 6.26. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel for He is the living God. But now i got a question for you. Now that God is no longer doing things like parting the Red Sea, leveling the walls of Jericho, or healing leprosy, or dele delivering, delivering believers from burning fiery furnaces, now that He's not doing that stuff, oh, can you see how important it is for you to witness for the Lord? Now that He's not witnessing for himself like that anymore. Hey, what's the point of knowing the difference that rightly dividing makes to our witness if you're not going to do any witnessing? Right? Now another thing that witness that God was the only true God was his ability to know the future. <laughs> I love it in your next reference when God taunted the false gods of the heathen by saying in Isaiah 41 and verse 23, show the things that are to come hereafter that we may know that ye are gods. <laughs> God says, I can tell the future. If you're real gods, why can't you? <laughs> and a God who can tell the future, folks, doesn't need any advertising. But listen, we live in the dispensation of the mystery. God is not making and fulfilling prophecy today. And He's not fulfilling the prophecies He made in the Old Testament either. He's not going to witness for Himself if you don't witness for Him. He's not going to witness for himself by fulfilling prophecies today any more than he's going to witness for himself by working miracles like he did in time past. Now all the time that God was witnessing that the Jews were his people by those miracles and fulfilling those prophecies, he had one problem that he couldn't overcome. And that was the sinfulness of His people in Israel. I mean, they might have laws that were high and holy, <laughs> but they didn't act high and holy, did they? So, when we come to the New Testament, God introduced a new plan to witness that the Jews were His people. And in so doing, that He was the only true God. And that is he planned to fill his people with his spirit and make it so they could not sin. He started in your next reference by predicting it in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, 27. 
He said, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and you will do them. And at Pentecost, it happened. Read those early chapters of the book of Acts. You won't see them committing a single sin. That's why John wrote to them in 1 John 3, 9 and 5, 18, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. He cannot sin. Whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Now listen, if you want to talk about a powerful God and a powerful witness, that's it. If, if you don't know how evil men are, and how hard it would be to get them to stop sinning. <laughs> Look what Job said. Here's a great description of the human race. In Job 15, verses 15 and 16, The heavens are not clean in God's sight. How much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity like water. Yeah, there's a good resume, huh? <laughs> But listen, getting creatures like that to stop sinning is a miracle. I mean, people read Isaiah's description of the kingdom of heaven on earth and they, they find it hard to believe that God is going to be able to change the nature of animals so the wolf and the lamb get along and the lion eats straw like the, like the ox or the bullock. But let me tell you, the greatest demonstration of God's power came at Pentecost when He changed the nature of men and got them to stop sinning. And like He's going to do again in the tribulation period, by the way. Now, unfortunately, a misunderstanding of all that has impacted the witness of Christianity in a negative way. When a Christian sins today, how many of you have heard people quote this verse in Matthew 7, 20 and 21? They see a Christian sin and they say, Ah, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but who? He that doeth the will of my Father. It is taught from the Lord's words there, if you're not producing fruit in your Christian life, if you're living in sin instead, people can know you're not saved. And listen, that was true at Pentecost. And it'll be true again in the tribulation. But it's not true today under grace. But the only way to know that it's not true today under grace is by rightly dividing the word of truth. And a failure to do that, a failure to rightly divide the word has led to a heresy known as lordship salvation. Their mantra is, you've heard it, if Jesus is not Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. If He's not Lord of everything in your life, He's not Lord at all. That is, if you're living in sin, well, you just can't be a true believer. Well, try telling that to the Corinthians. <laughs> they were as sinful a bunch of Christians as you'd ever want to meet. And yet what do we read in the opening verses of 1 Corinthians? Paul, call them saints. But you couldn't know that they were saints by their fruits, could you? You couldn't know they were saints by how they acted. You could only know they were saints by what they believed. Now, as you may know, Lordship Salvation was popularized by a man named John MacArthur. And I can tell you, if you haven't heard me tell this story before, I can tell you exactly how he came to believe in Lordship Salvation. He was a good Bible teacher at first. 
back in, I think it was 1988, he, he was just starting out on the radio. And I remember hearing him and thinking, wow, bless God, here's a guy who's at least trying to teach the Bible. So I'd listen to him while I was painting as a painting contractor. At the same time, I was teaching the book of Matthew here at our church, verse by verse, like we always do. And when I found out that he'd written a three-volume commentary on Matthew, and I'm talking about some thick volumes, I bought it and, and used it as I was preparing the messages here. Listen, a lot of times non-grace pastors can help you think outside the box by showing you the wrong way to interpret the Bible, right? <laughs> well, after he fit, right after he finished writing his three-volume commentary on Matthew, his very next book introduced Lordship Salvation. And I remember thinking, yeah, I know why he wrote that book. If I had just written three volumes on the Gospel of Matthew and I thought Matthew was talking to you and I today in the Dispensation of Grace, I'd teach Lord's Salvation too. Because that's what Matthew teaches. He was just being honest with the Scriptures, folks. Lord's Salvation's in the Bible. Just not in the part of the Bible written to you or to anybody else today. They could know believers by their fruit at Pentecost and, and in, again in the tribulation. But you can't know them by their fruit today. And this failure to rightly divide the Word has affected how Christians witness. Because a lot of people who believe in Lordship Salvation witness by telling sinners Make Jesus the Lord of your life. You ever heard that one? Sure. Make Jesus the Lord of your life if you want to be saved from your sins. The problem with that is, if you promise to make Jesus the Lord of your life, you're promising to obey Him. Look at your next reference. Luke 6 and verse 46. The Lord said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. You call someone your Lord, you're saying, yes, I'm going to do what you say. And listen, if you promise to obey the Lord to get saved, what happens after you get saved and you don't obey Him? What happens when you sin instead? You're going to be tempted to think, maybe I'm not saved. Beloved, do not confuse sinners into promising to make Christ their Lord when all you want is for them to make Christ their Savior. Can you see the difference that rightly dividing makes to our witness? Now there's one final way that rightly dividing makes to our witness and we see it when we look at how the Lord said that He testified in John 7.7. 7. He said, The world, me it hateth. Why? Because I testify of it that the works of the world are evil. In other words, the Lord went around testifying that the world is evil. People are evil. And so did John the Baptist. Matthew 14, 3 and 4. Herod had laid hold on John and bound him, put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, because he'd married his brother's wife. And John flat out told him, it is not lawful for thee to have her. Now, you know why they witnessed that way. They were here to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. A kingdom in which everybody will be sinless, including rulers like Herod. But if you don't rightly divide the word, you're going to think what most Christians think today, and that is that it's our job to tell sinners they're evil. Right? The reason they do that is because they think it's our job to bring in the kingdom. Do you ever hear that? 
I sent my kids to a Christian preschool and that was, that was their motto. Bringing in the kingdom. I remember we had a magnet on the refrigerator, you know, with their, you know, we wanted their phone number handy in case, you know, we needed to call them or something right away. And, and that's it. This such and such a church bringing in the kingdom. <laughs> that's why Christians spend their time protesting abortion and gay rights and all the rest of society's evil. They think they're bringing in the kingdom by doing that. But what did Pastor O'Hare say about that? He said if the church is going to bring in the kingdom, it's going to have to back it in because it ain't heading in that direction. <laughs> right? And your Apostle Paul says the only sinners you should tell are sinners are saved sinners in the church. Look at 1 Corinthians 9, 5, 9-12. to Paul says, I wrote unto you not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of the world. You'd have to leave the world for that. Then must you needs to go out of the world. But if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, you don't eat with him. And then look what Paul says. For what have I to do to judge them that are without Christ? He says, it's not my job to judge unsaved sinners. And if it ain't his job, it ain't yours either. All you do when you judge unsaved sinners, people without Christ, is alienate them and get them to turn a deaf ear to the gospel that smart Christians are out there preaching instead. And all it does when you judge or you criticize rulers is make them less inclined to favor churches like they do with our tax-exempt status and stuff like that. You know what God said about that in Job 34.18. He says, Is it fit to say to a king, Thou art wicked, and to princes, ye are ungodly? Notice it doesn't say it's not fit to say to a king that he's wicked if it's not true. He says it's not fit, period, to say to a king, Thou art wicked, or to a prince, ye are ungodly. How often have I said, God has a plan to fix all the governments of the world. It's called the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ to defeat the Antichrist and set up the kingdom. So it is undispensational to try and fix the government today. As undispensational as it is to try and bring in the kingdom. Not to mention it's useless. <laughs> I mean, the Apostle Paul says the, talks about the course of this world. You know what the direction the course of this world is. Downward. So just plan on the government getting worse and you won't be disappointed. Right? Does all this help you see the importance of being a witness? God did His own witnessing in the Old Testament by His miracles and fulfilled prophecy. He did His own witnesses, witnessing in the New Testament by making His people sinless. But He's not witnessing in those ways today. And He's not fulfilling prophecy either. He's left it up to us to do His witnessing. Don't forget, today, Jesus Christ is the head of the body of Christ. He's the head, and we're the body, right? And I don't know how, about, how your body works, but if my head wants something done, my body's got to do it. Now that my son's... Well, he's back now. I can get him to do a few things. <laughs> Uh, he's back from college. But when I'm laying on the couch thinking about doing the dishes, thinking about doing the vacuuming, I can tell you this, I can think about it all I want, but until I get my behind off the couch, it doesn't get done. And the same is true in the body of Christ. Jesus Christ, our head, can think about the witnessing that He wants to do in the world, as I know He does. But if you and I as members of the body don't do it, it doesn't get done. Let me close with 
one of the ways that God's going to witness in the future, in the tribulation. It's described in your last reference there in Revelation 14 and verse 6. John said, I see in a vision. <clears throat> he says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth. And I'm talking about to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. In that day, folks, in the tribulation, God is going to send an angel to fly over men and witness. But if you sit back and wait for that to happen, a whole lot of people are going to miss the rapture, aren't they? Amen. Beloved, we have the only plan of salvation on the planet. And we have the only way of understanding the Word of God. What do you say we tell people about it? Amen? Amen.